I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. If you're visiting, we want you to know that we love you, and uh, we'd love to have the opportunity to meet you at the close of the service. Take your Bibles, take your iPads, iPhones, whatever, and turn with me to Luke 24. Uh, while you're finding the passage, let me just take a few moments and uh, thank Brad, Pastor Brad and Pastor Thomas for preaching these past two Sundays. Yeah, let's let them know how much we appreciate them. I want you to know I'm so proud of the team that God is building here at Hollywood Community Church. Brad and Thomas, along with Pastor Jose, form an incredible team of pastors. And I am honored to work alongside of them. God has given us a great board of elders that are actively involved in ministry. And our deacon teams, man, our deacon teams are out each and every week ministering in the hospitals. Our community outreach team is, is ministering through our food pantry. And then, uh, man, there's so many different teams. Our first impressions that are around the building, our children's ministry, our praise team, our Spanish service that's going on as we speak. There's so many things that God is doing here at Hollywood Community Church, and I'm honored. I'm so very honored to be a, a part of it. And let's not take for granted granted all that God is doing. And we want you to be a part. We want you to be involved. If you haven't found your place of ministry, we would encourage you to do so. Well, this morning we continue our teaching on the Apostles' Creed. Thus far, we have studied three distinct phrases. And I'd like to take a moment this morning to quote the three phrases that we have already studied. I'm gonna put it up on the screen. You can grab it, it's in your bulletins if you want to, but I want us to read those first three phrases together. This is a declaration of faith. It's not a declaration of faith that we have written. If you'll remember several weeks ago, this was written hundreds and hundreds of years ago that has bound the church together for years. And so let's read the beginning. We'll put it up on the screen. You read it with me all together. Ready? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. I loved hearing you guys, but you mind doing it again? That was just kind of cool, hearing everybody do it. Let's say it again, and let's really emphasize that I believe part. Would you say it with me again? Ready? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. I trust that you believe those things. This morning we tackle one of the foundational truths of Christianity, the death of Jesus Christ. The Apostles' Creed declares it this way. I believe in Jesus Christ, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. Some of the uh, older creeds say he descended to hell. Let me make just a couple introductory statements about that part of the creed that we are going to be studying this morning. I find it very interesting that the Apostles' Creed mentions nothing of Jesus' life from his birth to his death. If you remember last week, Thomas talked about the virgin birth, and today we jump right to the death of Christ. It's interesting, there's not a word about Jesus walking on water or confronting the Pharisees or healing the sick. Why would they overlook so many important events? 
We'll talk about that in just a few moments. The Apostles' Creed uses four phrases to describe Jesus' death. We just mentioned it. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried and descended into hell. Someone might sit back and say, wow, isn't that overkill? Four statements about his death. And then the phrase descended to the dead some of them, if you uh, quoted them in another church when you were growing up, the, the creed that you might have quoted or, or, or quoted might have said, he descended into hell. That is by far the most controversial of all the statements in the Apostles' Creed. What does that mean? And how does that apply to us? Well, those are all truths that we want to tackle this morning in our study. But we're going to begin by reading a short passage in Luke chapter 24. Now before we read it, let me just say a couple of things. Luke 24 is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. If you remember, Luke 24 continues the story or contains the story of the resurrection. Uh, you may remember a few months ago, uh, it was our basis for our Easter Sunday morning service as we, as we remembered and we rejoiced in the fact that you and I serve a risen Savior. The majority of Luke 24 contains an intimate discussion between two travelers that were returning from the Passover celebrations in Jerusalem. The text says that they were traveling to Emmaus. There's been a, a famous picture that's been painted called the Road to Emmaus. My mom and dad have it at their house that pictures those two travelers. Well, as those two travelers were traveling back from the Passover celebrations, back from Jerusalem, to Emmaus, they were having this in-depth conversation. The topic of their conversation was the arrest, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus. Now, as they travel along, somewhere along the way, Jesus shows up. And, and, and Jesus obscures his identity. He kind of he kind of jumps in the conversation there, jumps in the travels. A third person comes along and begins listening to their conversation, but they do not know that it's Jesus. He obscures his identity. Jesus feigns ignorance as to the weekend's events, and eventually towards the end of the chapter, Jesus reveals himself to those startling travelers. If you haven't read that chapter, I'd encourage you to do so. Once again, it's one of my favorite New Testament stories. But as Jesus reveals himself to those travelers, he makes a profound statement as to the purpose and the necessity of his death and his resurrection. Notice what Jesus says. Luke chapter 24, we'll begin reading in verse 44. <clears throat> then he said, when I was with you before, I told you everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. By the way, let me put a plug in for our Wednesday nights because we're studying Jesus in the Old Testament. And here Jesus says, I told you everything that was said about me in those Old Testament books. Verse 45 then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Verse 46, and he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer. Some translations say it was necessary. I like that. It was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. And those of us who have received forgiveness of sins today would say, Amen. Amen. Then he tells the disciples, you are witnesses of all these things. Would you pray with me today? <clears throat> Lord, I pray this morning as we look at 
this remarkable truth. The truth that you loved us so much that in spite of our sinful condition, you sent Jesus Christ to die for us. And as we sang this morning, he truly did pay it all. There's nothing that we must do to obtain salvation other than place our faith and trust in him. So Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning to understand the significance of the death of Jesus Christ. Help us to understand everything that Jesus went through for us. If there's someone here today that has never given their heart and life to Jesus, may today be the day that they do that. And for those of us that are already believers, Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper that we're going to take in just a few moments. Teach us from your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm gonna ask uh, forgiveness ahead of time. I've been sick all week long, and so if my voice cracks during the message, I'm not going through puberty or anything. It's just I'm, I'm struggling with my voice a little bit this morning. Our outline today is simple and directly taken from the Apostles' Creed. Our purpose is to understand why it was necessary for Jesus to suffer. Did you ever ask yourself that question? Why was it necessary for Jesus to suffer so much? We want to talk about that in the message this morning. How could God die, by the way? What exactly happened during those three days in the tomb? Most importantly, what does the death of Jesus mean for you and for me? Those are, those are great questions that I trust we walk away with the answers to today. Notice the first thing, if you're following along in your notes, the first thing is this, the first part of the phrase, Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. Now the fact that Jesus suffered is repeatedly mentioned throughout Scripture. As a matter of fact, we could take a lot of time this morning and trace through the Old Testament and the New Testament the simple fact that Jesus suffered. Let me just read a few verses for you. Luke chapter 9 and verse 22, Jesus said this, predicting his death. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18, looking back, says, Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. By the way, that, that's a great truth. Jesus understands us when we suffer because he suffered. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. 1 Peter 2.21, For God called you to do good even if it means suffering just as Jesus or just as Christ suffered for you. He is our example. You must follow in his steps. Over and over again, the Old Testament prophets, Jesus himself and the New Testament writers discuss the reality of Jesus' suffering. Now, Let's ask ourselves the question this morning, what does it mean when it says that Jesus suffered? Is it just talking about those last few hours when he was arrested and beaten? What is the scriptures, what are the scriptures talking about when it says that Jesus suffered? Notice a couple of things that I put in your outline. The first is this, his suffering was lifelong and did not only occur at his death. His suffering was lifelong. The word suffered sums up everything that happened between his birth and his death. Remember in the beginning we talked about the fact that the Apostles' Creed mentions the birth and then jumps straight to his suffering? Well, the word suffering entails everything that happened in Jesus' life from his birth to his death. It's important for us to realize that his sufferings did not begin on the cross but it was his sufferings that led him to the cross. Let me give you a couple of uh, uh, explanations there. First of all, Jesus suffered because of his limitations. Jesus suffered because of his limitations. John 1.14 says it this way, you know the verse. And the word became flesh, 
and made his home among us and dwelt among us. Now, you and I read that and we say, sounds normal to me. Sounds like a normal statement because the only thing that you and I know is what? Humanness. That's, that's all we know. We only know life on this earth. You and I are used to human limitations. Anybody get tired last night? Only about six of you. The rest of you stayed up all night long. All right, we're used to human li- Anybody else sick this week? All right, just a few of us. If not, I would love to pass that on to you. Let me give you a hug at the conclusion of the service. We're used to human limitations. Jesus wasn't. Think, okay, I need you to put your thinking caps on today, okay? Listen, for all of eternity past, before the incarnation, the uh, nothing could contain Jesus. He was, he was transcendent. He, he was above and beyond our universe. He was greater than anything. He wasn't a part of it. He was beyond it. Nothing could contain him. Then at the incarnation, Jesus came to earth. And Jesus was limited to earth, to life, and to a human body. Sometimes we don't get that. Let me illustrate. This is a stupid illustration, but let me illustrate that for just a second, okay? Humor me for just a second, all right? You and I are used to having all kinds of freedom. We're able to walk around. Up here on the platform, I can walk around. I have all kinds of freedom. I can do what I need to do. I can go where I need to go. But imagine with me all of a sudden if someone said, okay, Brian, you have to live the rest of your life underneath this table, okay? And so all of a sudden, I crawl underneath this table, And now, I have to live the rest of my life underneath this table, okay? Everything I do, whether I eat or whether I interact with my family or whether I preach on Sunday morning, I have to do everything underneath this table. That'd be kind of crazy, would it not? All right, do you get the point? All right. Now, think with me today. Magnify that a million times over. Before Jesus came to earth, nothing contained him. And now all of a sudden, the omnipresent, omniscient Son of God places himself on planet earth. And not only places himself on planet earth, but he places himself within a human body. And all of a sudden, God the Son, who previously had never been limited, all of a sudden is limited to one location. He who in all of eternity past had controlled the universe now became contained within it. When the text says that Jesus suffered, we can talk about he suffered because of his limitations. We can, we can talk about the fact that he suffered because of his temptations. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 states that he faced the exact same temptations that we do. Think with me this morning of the most difficult temptation that you face. No, no really. Think about the one that you really struggle with. The one that you don't want anyone else to know about. Jesus faced that temptation as well. Of course, he was under extreme demonic attack there in Matthew chapter 4 when he was sent into the wilderness for 40 days and he was tempted by the devil. But that wasn't the only time that Jesus was tempted. He was tempted throughout his life. And God himself suffered through temptation. I must add, though, without sin. Although Jesus knew temptation, he did not know sin. So when we say that Jesus suffered, we talk about the fact that that he suffered because of his limitations. He suffered because of his temptations. He suffered because of his his experiences. He experienced all of the disappointments and heartaches of life that you and I experience. 
Most believe that Joseph, his earthly father, died when Jesus was still young. He would would have experienced that as a part of a family. Lazarus, one of his very best friends, died. Jesus experienced tragedy just as you and I do. In Isaiah 53 and verse 5, Isaiah says that he was a man of sorrows and he was familiar with grief. So it's important for us to realize that Jesus' suffering, when it mentions his suffering, it's not just talking about the sufferings on the cross, and we'll see those in just a few moments, but it's talking about lifelong suffering that he endured while he was here on the earth. The second thing that I wrote in my notes, and it goes along with the Apostles' Creed, is that his suffering was historically validated by the involvement of Pontius Pilate. Uh, One of the big questions as you study the the Apostles' Creed is why in the world is Pilate's name mentioned there? He's the only other person other than the Godhead that's mentioned there, and it says that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. Why didn't it say that Jesus suffered under Herod? Or why doesn't it say that Jesus suffered under Caiaphas? Pontius Pilate is specifically mentioned. Most believe that the reason that Pontius Pilate is mentioned in the creed is to simply validate the historicity of Jesus' sufferings. You see, what Jesus went through happened at a real time. It happened at a real place in history. It's not mythological. It's not something that happened in a faraway, make-believe land. This really happened. And it happened at a time in history under a real procurator of Rome, a real governor of Rome named Pontius Pilate. The third thing that I wrote down about his sufferings is this. His suffering was not only physical, but also emotional and spiritual. Now, now, we're going to get to his physical suffering in just a second. I certainly don't mean to minimize that. But it's important for us to realize that when it says that Jesus suffered, it's not just talking about physical suffering, but we're talking about emotional suffering. We're talking about spiritual suffering as well. You say, Brian, how could Jesus have suffered spiritually? Well, the answer is very simple and yet very profound. His spiritual suffering was the result of sin. Not his sin, but your sin and my sin. It's so very important for us to realize that Jesus did not sin, but there on the cross, Jesus bore our sins. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin. I love how the King James says it. uh, God made him who knew no sin to be sin. For us, so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Think with me this morning how that must have anguished His soul. Now, now, now think, you and I know something of that anguish. Whenever, whenever we sin, there's a, there's a sense of guilt, is there not? I trust that there is. If you have the Holy Spirit of God living within you, whenever you sin, there's a, there's a sense of guilt. There's a, there's a sense of conviction. There is an awareness that something is not right. As a matter of fact, the more that you and I grow spiritually, the more we grow in our holiness, the more that we are disgusted by, the more that we are nauseated by our sin. Now imagine Jesus the perfect, spotless Son of God who never, ever, ever knew sin. And there on the cross, all of your sins and all of my sins and all of the world's sins were placed upon him. (coughs) He not only carried the sins of one man, but the sins of the entire world. There's no way that you and I can begin to imagine the spiritual anguish that Jesus went through on the cross. By the way, that sure is a motivation for us to not take our sin lightly, is it not? 
Sometimes because forgiveness is so readily available to us, it's easy for us to say, hey, you know what? I can just go pray and ask forgiveness and it's no big deal. Man, it is a big deal because Jesus bore your sins in his own body on the tree and he bore mine. He suffered spiritually. I want you to see a second thing though. He not only suffered spiritually, but Jesus suffered emotionally. His his emotional suffering was the result of abandonment. You might sit back and say, man, Brian, that's a strong word. What, What do you mean that Jesus was abandoned? Who abandoned Jesus? Well, think with me. First of all, we know that the disciples deserted him. Remember the disciples that said, hey man, I want you to know we're with you, we're gonna fight with you, and here come the Roman soldiers, and what did the disciples do? Boom, they were out of there as quick as they possibly could. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the fact that Jesus was abandoned, we're not talking about the fact that the disciples left him alone, or that you and I potentially even would have abandoned him. That's not what caused him the most grief. Let me show you a verse in Matthew 27, verse 46. You might want to take this in your Bibles and look at it. Matthew 27, 46, Jesus is hanging on the cross. This is one of Jesus' declarations on the cross, one of his final declarations on the cross. Matthew 27, 46, at about 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sevachtenai, which means... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There on the cross, bearing the sins of the entire world, Jesus found himself alone. The communion that Jesus had experienced with God the Father for all of eternity for that period of time on the cross was broken. The intimate experience that Jesus had with the Father was temporarily broken. And there on the cross, Jesus faced the weight of the guilt of millions of sins alone. God the Father, as it were, turned his back in his holiness. God could not view sin. And God the Father turned his back on the Son. And Jesus, recognizing that separation, cries out, my God, God, why have you forsaken me? Let me pause here for a second and jump ahead to the last phrase that we're looking at today in the Apostles' Creed. The last phrase says, what says, Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried, and he descended to the dead. Some some translations say he descended into hell. As I mentioned, that is the most controversial phrase of the whole Apostles' Creed, and it's spawned many different teachings It spawned the belief that Jesus literally descended into hell. And some look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 and 1 Peter 4, 6 and believe that. Others say that Jesus went into hell and and he preached the gospel to the people in hell. And that's even caused some people to think why Jesus went into hell, preached the gospel, and gave everybody in hell a second chance to believe in him. I do not believe that is what the church fathers intended to say. And by the way, I don't have near the time to discuss that in this morning's message, so I'm going to give a little caveat. I'm going to write a blog about that tomorrow. We're going to deal with all the theological ramifications and all the verses and talk about that. But I believe this is what Jesus was saying. The separation from the Father is the meaning of the phrase descended to the dead. The separation from the Father at that moment was spiritual death for Jesus. Think with me today. I don't want to lose you. The real punishment in hell, think with me today, is not the darkness. The real punishment in hell is not the fire. 
Sometimes when we think about hell, we think of the atrocity of the fire and the darkness. And all of those are horrific, and I understand all of that. But the real suffering in hell is separation from God. The fact that that person will be separated from God for all of eternity. There on the cross, Jesus experienced that for a moment. He was separated from God the Father and spiritually died at that moment as a human being. That was the ultimate suffering. Jesus suffered for us. Let me show you the second phrase. The second phrase says this, Jesus was crucified. Since crucifixion is not a modern day punishment, it's difficult for us to comprehend how horrible it really was. Let me give you a a few facts about crucifixion so that we can understand it. Crucifixion originated not with the Romans, it originated with the Persians. It was the Romans, though, that perfected it. And the Romans did perfect it. Crucifixion was designed not just to kill the victim. If they could have done that, they could have decapitated the victim. They could have beheaded the victim. But crucifixion was designed not just to kill, but to maximize pain and suffering. When a person was crucified, they went through unbelievable, excruciating pain. You say, Brian, why would that be? Well, the victim would generally be nailed to the cross. The the nail would be placed in the wrist and in the center of the foot. By the way, that was driven, the nail was driven close to the medial nerve, which would cause extreme pain. In order for the victim to breathe, they would have to pull themselves up on those nails in their wrists and in their feet, and and they they would breathe then they would inhale until they could no longer handle the pain and then they would exhale and they would drop as the body weakened the victim would be forced to trade breathing for pain and eventually the victim would die of asphyxiation lack of lack of oxygen and excess carbon dioxide in the blood they say that the average victim on the cross endured for three to four days of that type of suffering. Suffering was intended to maximize pain. Crucifixion was the most disgraceful form of execution. It was generally reserved for slaves, foreigners, revolutionaries. It was reserved for vile criminals, not just any criminal, it was reserved for the worst of criminals. If you're like me, you read all of that and you ask yourself the question, why then did Jesus have to be crucified? Couldn't couldn't God have allowed Jesus to have experienced a more humane death? Why couldn't he have had a heart attack? Why couldn't he have been hit by a car? Why couldn't he have been beheaded? Why why did he have to go through such a painful, uh, horrific experience? Why couldn't he have died? A normal death. There are several important reasons. Let me give them to you quickly. The first is this. Only crucifixion fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. Only crucifixion fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy. Psalm 22, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. But, but By the way, what a great description. If you want to read Psalm 22, it's interesting how David perfectly describes crucifixion. And crucifixion didn't even exist when David writes about it. Isaiah 53 and verse 5, he was pierced for our rebellions. He was crushed for our sins. Zechariah 12, 10, then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. They will look on me, whom they have pierced, and mourn for him. Even Jesus prophesied about his own death in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, saying, as Moses lifted up the bronze snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So everyone that believes in him will have eternal life. Only crucifixion fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. But there was a second reason. Crucifixion depicted the barbarity of sin. 
Crucifixion depicted the barbarity of that sin. Why did Jesus have to die that way? Was, not, was there not a more humane way for him to die for the sins of the world? The simple truth is that the Father had planned for specifically this type of execution because it so perfectly depicts the horrors of sin. Think with me today, sin causes pain, does it not? How many of us have experienced the pain of our sins and the pain of the sin of others? Crucifixion perfectly depicts that pain. Sin causes shame. As Jesus hung there on the cross, naked and exposed between two thieves, he perfectly depicted the shame that sin produces. The third thing is this. Crucifixion was the justifiable punishment for man's sins. Let us remember today that Jesus was not just paying the price for white lies, temper tantrums, and gossip. Jesus was paying the price for the most vile sins. Jesus bore in his body the condemnation for countless murders and violent rapes. Jesus paid the price for the sins of bloodthirsty criminals and ruthless mercenaries. Think of your worst sin today. No, think of your worst sin. The worst sin that you have ever committed. The one that you don't want anyone to know about. Well, Jesus knows about it. And he already paid the price for it. You see, the reality is that such crimes demand ultimate justice. When we look at the cross, we see Jesus serving the just sentence for the sins of humanity. 1 Peter 2.24, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. The third statement is this. Jesus died and was buried. Whether we realize it or not, there are many that question the veracity of Jesus' death. In the late 1700s, theologians began postulating the idea that Jesus didn't die on the cross. He merely passed out. And they took him down off the cross, put him in a cool tomb, and after sitting there laying in a cool tomb for a couple of days, he miraculously revived and walked out of the tomb. They call it the swoon theory The theologians have postulated. To this day, Muslims actually deny that Jesus died on the cross. I read an Islamic website yesterday that claims to have 65 reasons why Jesus did not die on the cross. Well, the Apostles' Creed in the New Testament states very clearly that not only did Jesus die, but that Jesus was buried. I'll give me a couple of truths. His burial proves his death. His burial proves his death. Do you really think that Pilate, they, they crucified Jesus for being an insurrectionist? Do you really think that they would have taken a live body down off of the cross, placed it in a tomb, and placed a guard there if they did not believe that Jesus was dead? As a matter of fact, there's, there's tons of medical advice. The, the, the one soldier placing a spear in Jesus' side, and the, body, the Bible says that blood and water came out signifies that Jesus' heart had already somewhat erupted and there was water around the heart that signified that Jesus was dead at the moment. His burial proves his death. His burial alone makes the resurrection possible because you and I know that Jesus didn't go in the grave to stay in the grave. Jesus went into the grave to rise from the dead three days later and his burial makes that possible. His burial demonstrates his humanity while his resurrection demonstrates his deity. Here's what the Apostles' Creed, Jesus su says, Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, he was died, he died and was buried and descended to the dead. So this morning as we wrap this up and we prepare to take the Lord's Supper in just a few moments, what are the applications 
for you and me. What, what does this mean for us? Uh, what can we put in our pocket, sink our teeth into, and walk away from being encouraged and challenged today? The first is this. Jesus was born to suffer and to die. It's so very important for us to realize Jesus came into the world with one purpose. That purpose was to live a life of suffering that would ultimately end in the cross so that he would pay for your sins and for mine. That was the purpose of his life. He didn't come just to live an exemplary life, and he did that. He didn't live just to perform wonderful miracles to demonstrate the power of God. He did that. Jesus was born to suffer and to die. It's important for us to realize that. Jesus' death was all-inclusive. I really want you to catch this. Here's what I mean. There is no sin so vile that it is not covered by the death of Jesus. There is no sin so vile that it is not covered by the death of of Jesus. Frequently I meet with people that say, Brian, you have no idea what I've done. And I'm able to tell them, no, I don't. But God does. And Jesus already paid the price for it. There is no sin so vile that Jesus did not pay the price. The last is this. Jesus' death was substitutionary. It was vicarious. But, but, By that I mean that Jesus didn't die for his own sins, but he died for your sins, and he died for my sins. He died in our place. He took our place. He was our substitute. He was the perfect lamb of God that took our sins upon himself and died in our place. So this morning, we come to the Lord's table, and this morning we remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. How do you respond to somebody that's given everything to you? How do you demonstrate that? Well, Jesus told us, first of all, he said, listen, believe in me. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. If you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you've never become a follower of Jesus, you do that very simply by admitting you're a sinner, by trusting, by believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart and to be your personal savior. If you've never done that, you can do that right where you're seated this morning. I'd love to have the opportunity to pray with you or have one of our our team pray with you. You wanna come down and grab my hand in just a minute. We can lead you in that prayer. As a believer who's already been redeemed and saved, we demonstrate gratitude by frequently remembering what Jesus has done for us. So this morning, we take these elements and we remember. We remember that Jesus is alive. He's here with us today. And we remember what Jesus has done for us. 